At exactly 0545 on May 26, 2025, this Ukrainian Air Force pilot strapped himself into the cockpit of a MiG-29 fighter that had no business carrying the weapons it had bolted to its wings. Within minutes, this 40-year-old Soviet fighter would attempt something its designers never imagined, delivering French precision-guided bombs against Russia's most feared security agency using American GPS satellites and Ukrainian software held together by zip ties and a prayer. As the pilot taxied toward the runway, he could feel the weight of history. No one had ever attacked an FSB facility in this war. The intelligence services were supposed to be untouchable, protected by layers of security and the implicit understanding that some targets were off limits, until now. The mission profile was insane, even by Ukrainian standards. He would have to fly at treetop height to avoid radar, then suddenly climb to 5,000 meters for the weapon's release, a maneuver that would light him up on every radar screen from here to Moscow. He'd have maybe 20 seconds to release the bombs and dive back to safety before Russian air defenses could respond. At 0558, the pilot advanced the throttles. Two Klimov RD-33 turbofans roared to life, generating 18,000 pounds of thrust. The MiG-29 lurched forward, accelerating toward the runway with its impossible payload. In the growing dawn light, the Frankenstein fighter lifted off, carrying French engineering, American satellites, and Ukrainian determination toward a date with Putin's feared security service. The FSB would soon learn what three years of Ukrainian innovation could accomplish. At 0615, the pilot's MiG-29 screamed across the Ukrainian countryside at just 50 meters of altitude, so low that his jet wash was bending wheat fields and scattering birds in terrified clouds. The terrain following flight was exhausting, constant stick and rudder inputs to avoid power lines, cell towers, and the occasional farmhouse, but it was the only way to stay invisible to the Russian radars that infested the border region. The margins he was flying in were incredibly slim. The S-400 systems protecting Belgorod could track and engage targets at 400 kilometers, if they could see them. But the Earth's curvature was the pilot's friend today. At 50 meters altitude, the radar horizon was only about 25 kilometers. As long as he stayed low, stayed fast, and didn't make any mistakes, he would remain a ghost. But in exactly three minutes, he would have to abandon that invisibility and climb right into their crosshairs with some less than ideal tech. The target coordinates glowing on his iPad, yes, an actual iPad duct taped to his instrument panel, marked the target. The Federal Security Service headquarters in Glotovo, Belgorod Oblast. Just five meters from the Ukrainian border, this wasn't some random military depot or ammunition dump. This was Putin's old agency, the successor to the KGB, the organization that had orchestrated countless operations against Ukraine. The two AASM hammer bombs hanging from his wings that he would soon deliver represented everything wrong and right about the mission. These French-made precision weapons were never designed to talk to Soviet avionics. The MiG-29's 1980s-era computer systems couldn't even comprehend the existence of GPS let alone process targeting data from satellites that weren't launched until years after the jet was built. Ukrainian engineers had solved this impossible problem with typical battlefield creativity. Custom pylons had been fabricated in Kiev workshops, with GPS antennas jury-rigged to the forward mounting points. Power cables snaked through access panels never meant to be opened, feeding French electronics with Soviet electricity. The AASM hammer itself was a masterpiece of French engineering a kit that transformed dumb bombs into precision munitions. Each unit, which cost more than most people's homes, featured inertial navigation backed up by GPS guidance that could put a 250 kilogram warhead through a specific window from 70 kilometers away. The range extension kit contained a solid rocket motor that would activate after release, pushing the bomb to near supersonic speeds. But all that sophisticated technology meant nothing if the Soviet jet couldn't tell the French bomb where to go. That's where the iPad came in, running software that translated modern targeting data into something the bombs could understand. It was the digital equivalent of duct tape, and it was about to be tested against the most sensitive target Ukraine had ever struck. At 0622, the pilot hit the initial point and yanked back on the stick, 
The MiG-29 responded instantly, its nose pitching up to 45 degrees as the G-forces crushed him into a seat. The altimeter spun wildly. 1,000 meters, 2,000, 3,000. His radar warning receiver exploded into chaos as every air defense system in Western Russia suddenly saw a fighter-sized target climbing into their engagement envelope. The cockpit filled with electronic screams as search radars locked on. The S-400 battery southeast of Belgorod was painting him with its 92N6 gravestone radar, measuring his speed, altitude, and heading. In seconds, the fire control system would have a solution. But the pilot had one advantage. Surprise! The Russians had less than 45 seconds from detection to engagement, and their procedures were built around conventional attack profiles. They would never expect Ukraine to do something so crazy, which is exactly why it might work. At 5,000 meters, the pilot hit the release point. The iPad showed optimal launch parameters as his thumb found the weapon's release. Two thuds shook the airframe as the AASM hammers fell away. Immediately, he rolled inverted and pulled hard, executing a modified Amelman turn that would have impressed the maneuver's World War I inventor. The MiG-29 curved through the sky, trading altitude for speed as the pilot dove back toward the safety of low altitude. Behind him, the two bombs were well on their way to the target. Their rocket motors ignited with a flash, accelerating them along the ballistic arc toward Glotovo. GPS receivers locked onto satellite signals, while inertial navigation systems measured every tiny deviation. The bombs were now flying themselves, making hundreds of microcorrections per second to ensure they hit their pre-programmed coordinates exactly. The toss bombing maneuver he just performed was a relic from the Cold War developed when nuclear-armed fighter bombers needed to deliver gravity bombs without flying directly over their targets. The physics were simple, climb at a steep angle, release the bombs in an upward trajectory, then get out of dodge while momentum carried the weapons to their target. Simple in theory, but insane in practice against modern air defenses. Well, maybe. The Russian response was swift but futile. Two 48N6 interceptor missiles roared off their launch rails, racing to intercept the MiG-29. But the MiG was already back at treetop height, jinking hard left and right as he raced back to base. The interceptors, designed to knock out high-flying bombers, couldn't track a target hugging the Earth. They sailed harmlessly overhead, their proximity fuses finding nothing but an empty sky. In less than two minutes, the bombs would impact. The FSB officers in Glotovo had no idea that Justice was flying through the morning sky toward them, guided by satellites they couldn't see and technology they couldn't stop. The two AASM hammer bombs represented three decades of precision weapon evolution compressed into 250 kilograms. As they reached the apex of their trajectory at 8,000 meters, their onboard computers were performing calculations that would have required a room full of mathematicians just 50 years ago. Each bomb was essentially three weapons in one. First, the nose section contained the guidance package a marriage of military GPS receivers and ring laser gyroscopes that could navigate even if every satellite suddenly disappeared. The French had learned from American experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan that GPS jamming was the first move in any modern conflict, so they'd built the AASM to be unjammable. The inertial navigation system could fly the bomb to within 10 meters of its target using only the memory of its inertial position and the laws of motion but it was the middle section that made the AASM truly terrifying. Unlike the American JDAM, which simply guided a bomb to its target, the French had added a solid rocket motor that turned the weapon into a hybrid missile. This wasn't just falling with style. This was a powered flight that extended range to 70 kilometers and gave the bomb energy to penetrate hardened targets. The rocket motor burned for just 15 seconds, but that was enough to push the bomb to Mach 0.8 fast enough to complicate any last-second interception attempts. The tail section contained the control surfaces that would guide the bomb through its terminal dive. These weren't the simple fins of older bombs, but sophisticated control surfaces that could adjust their position 50 times per second. Combined with the guidance system, they could fly complex trajectories, even circling back to hit targets from unexpected angles. Today, they would drive the bombs almost straight down through the FSB building's roof. At 0627, the first bomb's radar proximity fuse detected the roof rushing up at 250 meters per second. The fuse performed one final calculation, determining the exact moment to initiate the detonation sequence. It had to account for the bomb's velocity, angle of impact, 
and the program delayed to ensure the warhead exploded at the optimal point inside the building. The second bomb followed exactly 0.3 seconds behind, aimed at a point 20 meters away to ensure maximum structural damage. Two precision weapons, guided by satellites 20,000 kilometers above, were about to deliver a very personal message to Putin's old stomping grounds. At 0619, Senior Lieutenant Smirnov was halfway through his morning tea when the S-400 early warning radar he commanded detected something unusual. Two fast-moving contacts had appeared on his screen, climbing rapidly from a low altitude approximately 40 kilometers southwest of his position. The computer classified them as fighter aircraft, probably Ukrainian MiG-29s based on their radar signature and climb rate. Smirnov had exactly 45 seconds to prevent a catastrophe, and the clock was already ticking. The S-400 Triumph system he commanded was, on paper, the most sophisticated air defense system in the world. Each battery consisted of multiple elements working in deadly harmony. The 92N6 Gravestone radar could track 300 targets simultaneously at ranges exceeding 600 kilometers. The 48N6 missiles could reach out 400 kilometers and engage targets from ground level to 30,000 meters straight up. The system could even intercept ballistic missiles, making it the crown jewel of Russian air defense. But all that sophistication came with a critical weakness, time. The S-400 needed around 10 seconds from detection to engagement when dealing with low-altitude pop-up targets. First, the search radar had to detect and classify the threat. Then the fire control radar needed to lock on and develop a firing solution. The missile itself required 3 seconds from launch command to leaving the rail, then the flight time to the target. Against high-altitude bombers or cruise missiles with predictable flight paths, this timeline worked perfectly. Against a fighter executing a toss-bombing maneuver, it was catastrophically slow. This was where the S-400's sophistication became a liability. The system was optimized for aircraft and missiles, not small guided bombs. The 48N6 missiles were massive weapons designed to knock down bombers, not surgical instruments for intercepting precision munitions. It was like trying to swat a fly with a sledgehammer. Two 48N6 missiles roared off their launchers at 06-26-45, racing toward the incoming bombs at Mach 6. But the geometry was all wrong. The bombs were now in a near-vertical dive, presenting a minimal radar cross-section. The intercept probability calculated by the fire control computer dropped from 85% to 12% as the missiles struggled to track the plunging targets. The missiles passed within 200 meters of the bombs, close enough to trigger proximity fuses under normal circumstances, but the bomb's terminal velocity and steep dive angle put them outside the target area. The 48N6 warheads detonated harmlessly, their fragments spreading through empty air as the French bombs continued their dive toward Gotovo. At 0627, the first AASM hammer punched through the roof of the FSB headquarters in Glutovo. The shaped charge detonated on impact, creating a jet of molten copper that carved through steel roof beams and concrete floors as if they were butter. The bomb's fuse, programmed for a 0.025 second delay, counted down with electronic precision as the warhead plunged through the building's upper structure. At detonation, its 87 kilograms of high explosive converted from solid to gas in microseconds. The blast wave expanded at 8,000 meters per second, creating overpressures exceeding 200 PSI, enough to take out anyone inside. The building's interior walls, designed to protect secrets rather than withstand military ordnance, provided no resistance. But the physics of destruction were just beginning. The explosion inside the enclosed structure created a phenomenon called reflected overpressure. The blast wave bounced off surviving walls and floors, doubling and tripling its destructive power. Windows didn't just break, they exploded outward in a shower of glass that would later be found embedded in buildings 300 meters away. Office furniture became projectiles, filing cabinets full of classified documents turned into metal confetti. The second bomb arrived 0.3 seconds later, striking 20 meters from the first impact point. By now, the building's structural integrity was already compromised. Load-bearing walls were gone and support columns shattered. The second explosion found a structure already on the verge of collapse and delivered the final blow. The blast propagated through the weakened framework like a destructive wave, causing what engineers refer to as progressive collapse. Floor by floor, the FSB headquarters began to eat itself. 
The fourth floor pancaked onto the third, adding its mass to the destruction. Then the fifth floor joined the cascade. Each collapse added kinetic energy to the disaster, turning the building into its own wrecking ball. In less than five seconds, what had been a five-story symbol of Russian state security became a smoking pile of rubble and secrets. Bye for now.